You can be seated. As you're being seated, open up to 101, page 101 in your, in your Bible study books that we've been going through. And we're going to start off with our new memory verse. We're in lesson five, and we fin last week we finished up lesson five, kind of introduced, got into lesson Less, or lesson, we finished up lesson four, kind of got into lesson five just a little bit, but we're talking about the fullness of the Savior. Prior to that, we talked about the futility of the flesh. Lots of bad news, lots of dark clouds in the futility of the flesh. How many of you, by a raise of hands, would say, I have experienced firsthand that the flesh is, in fact, futile? To, to, try, to, to try to live the Christian life in the power of your flesh, boy, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't work. You've tried it. I've tried it, we've all tried it, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work for any of us. Some of us might make it, oh, an hour. Some of us might make it a day, maybe, right? But, boy, we struggle with the flesh, and when we try to beat the flesh and the power of the flesh, it just doesn't work. So we need something else. Our memory verse is John chapter 10, verse 10, and the, the part that we're focused on, of course, is the last part where he, he talks about life more abundant. So let's do this as we have. We'll say the reference, then the verse, and then the reference again, John 10.10. 10. Are you ready? John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10. 10. From this verse... What does God want you to have? Life and life more abundant. Okay? More abundant in, in righteousness. More abundant in victory. Not more abundant in sin and defeat. God's intention for you is to have this kind of a life. As I mentioned, we dealt with the futility of self. We've all attempted to reform ourselves through our own grit and determination. And we've all failed at it. And the reason that we do this is because of indwelling sin. Indwelling sin. And we, we gave the illustration of gravity, right? Gravity is the constant pull towards the center of the earth. It's the reason that we can't fly. And you cannot break the law of gravity, but you can overcome the law of gravity, right? If you, if you go fast enough in an airplane, lift will be created, and you're not defeating the law of gravity, you're working with the law of gravity, and you're overcoming it. When you get into a hot air balloon, the law is, gravity pulls me down, but the stronger law is, if I can get enough hot air, I will, I will overcome the law of gravity. And it's not that you, as an individual, are special enough that gravity doesn't work on you anymore. And if you get to feeling that way, you can always step out of the basket. And you will discover very quickly, no, gravity still works. It's because you're in the basket. And we, the, the illustration, very simple. If we, are, if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're in the basket, you can float. If you're not in the basket, then you're bound by gravity. If you walk in the power of your flesh, then you will experience consistent defeat because of indwelling sin. We sing the song in Come Thou Fount where it says, prone to wander, Lord I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's where we live if we're not careful. But there's victory to be had in Christ, and that's what we're looking at. The hot air balloon, the gravity, it's not Breaking the law of gravity, it's overcoming the law of gravity. And the law of sin in our members is not going to be broken this side of heaven, but it can be overcome. And so now we come to lesson five. And if you look on page 101, just a very brief quote, he says, Like the constant pull of gravity, our flesh never goes away. Aren't, aren't you glad of that, that your flesh doesn't go away? That, that, would, that would present problems of its own. Although we can do nothing to make the flesh better, the Lord has promised to give us victory. You cannot, the Bible says, that, that nothing that I do in my flesh can please God. We, we will look at that even again here this morning. Take a look, turn over to 102. Question number one. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, what does God always do? Provide. What does God always provide according to this verse right here before us? It says, Now thanks be unto God, 
which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. What can we always have? Victory, victory right? Triumph is, is what you have when you have victory. John 10, verse 10, what we just said as our memory verse, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Question number three on page 102. What kind of work did God or did Christ promise those that believe on him? He says in John 14, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works, greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, I asked you last week, Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Does this verse mean I can feed 6,000 with four loaves and one fish? No, no, it's, it's works that are multiplied. And I gave you the, the example, when Jesus was here on earth, he was in one place geographically, because he was in flesh, like a man, because he was a man, okay? If he was in Judea, he wasn't in Galilee. If he was in Samaria, he wasn't in Judea. He was wherever he was geographically, and those were the people who could be affected by Jesus' ministry at, in, in person, okay? But now, Jesus ascended back to heaven, and he told his disciples before he went, went, he said, it's good for you that I go away, because if I go away, then I'll send the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, right? So now, where is the presence of God on earth now? When Jesus was here, it was wherever Jesus was. Where is the presence of God in 2021, right now? It's, it's right here, and it's right here, and here, 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 here. It's, it's in all of us because of the indwelling Spirit of God. So the works that he did, we'll do greater works because there's more of us. We can, we can go out. How many people could Jesus preach to at one time? Oh, thousands for sure. How, how many people, if every Christian on planet Earth decided to go out today and witness to one person, you think we'd reach more people than Jesus did? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. In his entire ministry, we'd reach more people than Jesus did. Greater works can be accomplished because we have the indwelling spirit of God. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So he has us to always triumph. He gives us life more abundant. He gives us greater works, and he gives us much fruit. That sounds good. That sounds like the kind of life I want to lead. How about you? As a believer, that sounds like the life of victory, where I'm producing fruit, where I'm effective in, in my ministry. Question number five on page 103. Take a look at it. It says, describe the victory that God promises in Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, so question B on page 103 is, what is your part in this victory? Right here, the, the verse that's on the screen or there in your book. What is your part in this victory? Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. If you want to float, you have to get in the basket. Okay? If you want to have victory, you have to walk in the Spirit. You say, I don't want to walk in the Spirit. Well, then you're going to experience defeat. I don't want to get in the basket. Then you can't, you can't fly because the law of sin will drag you down. The law of sin won't go away. It won't be broken. It can only be overcome. Question 6 on 103. Is Christ able to keep you from falling back into sin? I'm not going to put the verse up yet. You, you answer. Is Christ able to keep you from falling into sin? All of us would say, oh, yeah, absolutely, because he's God and he can do anything. Yeah, you're right, but here's a verse to tie that to, and it's a good one. Jude 24 says, now unto him that is able, this is Jesus, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. It has nothing to do with your footwear and keeping you upright physically. This is entirely spiritual, okay? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. 
I love this verse. <laughs> One of my favorites, certainly in the book of Jude. He, he says, when, when it says exceeding joy, it's the idea in the Greek of one who jumps up and clicks their heels together. When's the last time you were that excited? It's been a while. <laughs> I don't often reach that level of excitement where I, where I physically react, but that's what this verse is talking about. Now, it's interesting because in and of yourself, what, what do people do in, in the Bible? Think back in the Bible when people appear before God. What do they do? They fall down on their face, right? And they say, remember Peter? He said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. And Moses, he pulled his shoes off and fell on his face before the burning bush. All of this is, is how people appear before God. But this talks about how you and I can, can come before God one day with exceeding jumping for joy. That's going to have to be accomplished because of something other than, than me. That's because of him. That's because he is able to keep me from falling. He's able to give me that victory. He's able to give me much fruit and more abundant life and all of these things. What has God done for us according to Colossians 1.13? It says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, do we have any English people out here, English majors, or people who really like English? What's the, what's the tense of his translating us? Current, right? He, he, he did it. We are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. There was a change. God has done much for us. He's made us part of the family of God. He's given us new life. New life, new enablement. He's given us power to do what needs to be done. That verse, I can do all things. Oh, oh yeah, that's important, isn't it? Those two words. No, you, I have seen, literally, I've seen people take that verse out of context and they'll just have part of that printed on a, on a t-shirt where I can do all things. Try. <laughs> no, no, you can't. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God provides us with the power. Question number eight on page 103. Who gives us both the desire and the ability to do things that please God? Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will. That's your want to. You ever struggle with your want to? I do. I do. When I was little, my parents used to, they used to, when me or my brother was having a real hard time, my dad would say, oh, they got the can't help it. That's when you're struggling with your want to, right? I, I just, I, I know that I, I know what I should do, and you do too, but I don't want to. Or, more commonly, it's not that I don't want to do right, it's that I want this more, right? I want the pleasure that will be afforded me if I make this choice, and that's how we, but it is God which worketh in you both to will. He'll fix your want to. It's his, it's his power that will, will work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. On page 104, just a, a quote quickly, he says, The promises of victory over sin and power for ministry. So this is just talking about me, right? Ministry, because that's kind of it's what I do for a living, ministry. Is, that, is this just talking about me? No. Are you a minister? You better be. That's, that's why he left you here, was to be a minister, okay? After, after Jesus saved you, he could have just called you right up to heaven to be with him, but he didn't. He left you here to be part of ministry. He says, the promises of victory uh, of over sin and power for ministry don't remove our tendency to do wrong. We would all agree with this. The law of sin hinders holy living, even when we want to do what's right. Again, we've been there. We know that to be true. Jesus does not promise to remove the influences of the flesh and the world. He gives us strength to overcome them. Again, remember the balloon. He doesn't promise that he will retract the law of gravity. He promises that he will enable us to overcome 
through a greater law, a greater power, and he provides the power. We have, in Christ, the ability, the strength to do all things. That's exactly what we're talking about here. The law of gravity, not broken. The law of sin is not broken. It's just overcome. We've all experienced this. Now turn uh, to 107 and let's take a look at day two. Day two. Here's how it works. Well, we're, we'll get there maybe today. I never get done with all of my notes on Sundays, and that's okay. So if you have any questions, comments as we're going, please don't hesitate to let me know. Page 107, we're talking about the person of victory. Now, without reading ahead, if you have it, who are we talking about? Who's the person of victory? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. But just as we said, well, I know that God can keep me from falling. Let's put some Bible to it so that we have, we have that ammunition when the fight comes. It's a law that enables a hot air balloon to rise, overcoming the law of gravity. And it is a person who enables us to achieve victory over the world and the flesh. It is a person, and his name is Jesus. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who, who's in you? The Holy Spirit. God. The, the, the third person of the Trinity lives inside of me and is able to enable me. I am able to overcome because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Where is Christ physically right now? At the, right hand of, at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing there? He's doing it. He's doing quite a bit, right? He's sitting, right? He, the Bible says that when he made sacrifice for sin, he sat down, right? And I've got a whole message on that. There were no chairs in the, in the temple or the tabernacle. You know why? Because the priest's job was never done. They always had another sacrifice. But when Jesus offered himself, he went and ascended back to God and he sat down. Why? Because it's finished. Right? So that's, he's sitting at the right hand of God. He's interceding for you and for me. He prays for us. And he says in John 14 that he, he went to prepare a place for us. Now, if God could create everything that you see in six days... How long has he been working on the place for us? 2,000 years. You figure it's nice? I bet it is. Okay, so that's what Jesus is doing. That's where Jesus is. He is physically, he's in heaven, okay? Physically. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, question number three on page 107. In a spiritual sense, where and what is Christ today, according to Colossians 1.27? Well, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's, that's where and what he is the hope of glory. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This isn't our memory verse, but you should memorize Galatians 2.20. One of, one of the most powerful verses in the entire New Testament, in my opinion. Okay? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says that Christ is not only alive today, but he's living out his life in each and every believer. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth. In me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He alludes to, in the book, he alludes to Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the founder of the China Inland Mission. Phenomenal uh, man of God, and, and a great, if you're interested, I, I've got some books on him that I could recommend to you that, that would truly be a blessing to you. But he really latched on to this truth, the truth of the exchanged life. He called the, the not I but Christ liveth in me. He called that principle the exchanged life. As in living the exchanged life. What we're going through right now. 
Hudson Taylor said, the Lord Jesus received his holiness begun. What, what would that be? That would be just justification. The Lord Jesus received his holiness begun, right? I'm saved from the penalty of sin. He says, the Lord Jesus cherished his holiness advancing. We're talking about, about sanctification. When you love Jesus, then that's, that's half the battle, it seems sometimes. But then he says, the Lord Jesus counted upon as never absent would be holiness complete. When you're aware of the presence of God, always, it changes things. If, if Ter Terry sits in here in the front, so I pick on him a lot. So if, if, if Terry was going to go about his, the next three days, and I really want to be with Terry a lot. So I go and I buy a pair of handcuffs and I handcuff us together. So Terry and I are handcuffed together. I, where he goes, I go. So when he goes and he's he's carrying groceries, oh, I'm I'm right there with him. I'm 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 with I'm with Terry doing everything. Terry, how often would you forget that I'm there? It'd be hard to forget. It'd be real hard to forget. Why? Well, oh, because I got these handcuffs. I'm chained to Pastor Ben, and I I can't forget about it. Okay, where's Jesus? Amen. He's closer than handcuffs. Yeah. Okay? How often do you forget about it? Oh, now that, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> because, because there's not the clink. There's not, the, there's not that little bit of pinch when, when you pull on the handcuff. But Jesus is here, and when we have the awareness that Jesus is here, and he's here right now, then, then everything changes. The way that you behave, Terry, might, I don't know, but might have some things that he was going to do that he says, you know what? Because I'm chained to Pastor Ben, I'm going to wait until we're done with this before I do those things. Just because it's make no, nothing, nothing nefarious, just it's more convenient to do this with just one person. Okay, And, and that's how it is with, with Christ. We, we forget about him sometimes. But if, if we were constantly aware of the presence of Christ in our lives, we, it would change our behavior. Would, would you do the same things that you do if Jesus were physically sitting there next to you? You'd say, well, <coughs> most of them. There's a few things that kind of, well, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And Jesus is sitting closer than next to you. He's within. According to Galatians 2.20, how do you access the life of Christ? He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What do you have to do to make your apple tree bear apples? You, you mostly just leave it alone, right? Why? Because it's an apple tree. What do apple trees do? Well, they bear apples. And do you ever, I have, I have four apple trees uh, next to my garden, and I walk past them, and sometimes it's quiet, and, and I never hear the apple trees going, trying to force out apples. Okay, you know why? Because it's a natural thing for apple trees to bear apples. You know what's natural for a Christian, someone who's alive in Christ? You know what's natural for them? To have Christ living in them. To, to manifest that, that, that life. It, is, is it through tremendous power? No, it's, it's through allowing Christ to live his life through me. A quote on page 108. Living the exchange is the continuing work of the exchange Christ made with us at salvation. He traded places with us, bearing the punishment of our sin on the cross and making us the righteousness of God in him. Now you remember earlier when we mentioned Galatians 3.3. 3, are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Who did the work in justification? Jesus. Jesus. How about how about you? Was it like 90-10? 99-1? hundred percent God, wasn't it? We're, we can't save ourselves. So so as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, Colossians 2 6. Now we read in Galatians 3 3 that what was begun in the spirit, are you going to make perfect in the flesh? The saving that began with justification is not going to be fixed and perfected by you in the flesh. That's the futility of the flesh. We're talking about the person of victory. 
Take care that we don't attempt to continue in the flesh what was begun and is only truly possible by the Spirit. Colossians 2.6, as I just mentioned, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You received him by grace through faith. And if, if you will walk in him, you will walk in him by grace through faith. Now, we're going to get a little bit more practical. On day three, turn over to page 111. The author uses the illustration of iron being placed into the fire and heated. I think it's fascinating whenever I've gotten the opportunity to see people work with, <coughs> work with uh, in, a, in a foundry or in a smith type of a, an environment. It's, it's pretty neat to see. But he, he mentions that what was once hard, rigid, and unbending becomes red hot and malleable. You can, you can take an iron bar and you can get it hot enough and you can twist it up. You could tie it, literally, you could tie it in a knot. Okay? What was once hard and unbending cold and and just the way that it is it's rigid you can take that you can put it in the fire and you get it hot enough and you can make that which was hard rigid and unbending you can make it do anything that you want it to do but on page 111 he says the fire changed the very characteristics of the iron what is now seen in the effect of the fire what is now seen is the effect of the fire on the iron nothing about the iron changed Okay? It's still iron. And when the iron is removed from the fire, it will return to its former state. When you, when you take it out, you've got very little bit of time that you can work with it. That's why they, they keep putting it back into the kiln. They keep putting it in there where they can get it hot. How long, if you've seen metal like this, how long does it stay that color? Not long after it's iron. When it's out of the fire, it's seconds, okay? Now, they're working with it. You can see they're, they've twisted this. Now, you couldn't twist that iron bar just by your hands, but, but you could with the right tools when it's hot. The illustration is fairly simple. Walking in the spirit is similar to the iron in the fire. When we're walking in Christ, what was hard and cold and rigid and unbending becomes malleable it becomes able to be manipulated by the spirit of god when we stop walking in christ when you take me out of the fire it it's not going to work long i'm going to get hard i'm going to get i'm going to get unbending again real fast and we've all experienced this question number 2 on page 111 what does the son give to those who live in him, according to John 8, verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What's he give us? Freedom. He gives us freedom. Freedom is freedom from sin, freedom from vices, freedom from habits with which you've struggled your entire life. That freedom is available to you in Christ. Question number three on page 111. From what does Jesus deliver us? Well, according to Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and of our Father. Now, since the Bible is the timeless word of God, this doesn't only apply to the church in Galatia. This applies to you. This applies to me. That, that Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he could deliver us from this present evil world, okay? Justification, he gave, he gave himself and purchased our redemption and so that we can, we can be made sons and daughters of God and he would deliver us from this present evil world until we no longer need that deliverance because we're in his presence, because we're, we're in glory and we've been glorified. It is, it is God's business to see to it and to provide the victory that we need from the moment of salvation till the moment of glorification. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah. On scriptural principles. Can you agree with that? Absolutely. Now, are there any questions here before we look at day four? Any questions? Okay. Then day four, 
is on page 115. And it is how to access the grace of God for daily living. Actually, real quick, before we do that, flip back to page 112. I skipped over a spot here in my notes. Question number four on page 112 says, whose, whose life is clearly seen in the life of one who chooses to identify with the gospel through the death of self? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Whose life should be made manifest in my body? Is this talking about like a spiritual body? No, it's talking about this body. That's the only body I've got. Okay? That the, that the life of Christ, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body and in your body. Galatians 2.20, once again, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, this body, okay, there is victory to be had in this body, okay, we're not just talking about glorification. We're talking about in the flesh. I can have victory right now. And so we come to day four, which is how to access the grace of God for daily living. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Question number one on page 115. How can our lives show Jesus to the world around us? Romans chapter five, verse one says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we, we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. How can our lives show Jesus to the world around us? Two times in this verse. By faith. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so... Walk ye in him. Remember the three components of saving faith that we talked about? This is, this is back from weeks ago. You remember this? The three parts of saving faith. Okay? You have to have knowledge. Okay? You have to know about Jesus in order to get saved, right? You can't get, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby <clears throat> we must be saved. You have to have knowledge. You have to have agreement too, right? You have to agree, well, I believe, not only do I know that the Bible is, is, is accurate, but I believe it to be true. You have to have that. But then, that third part of saving faith is dependence. Placing your dependence in Christ alone for salvation. And we've, we've gone into this at great length in the past. But, he says on page 115, the faith that accesses sanctification has the same three elements as the faith required for salvation or justification. While faith for salvation changes our position, faith for daily living changes our practice. Sanctifying faith. The same three parts. Just as to be saved, you have to know about Jesus, you have to agree that it's true, and then you have to place your dependence in Christ alone plus nothing. So, for you to walk in victory and to experience daily, daily victory, you have to have knowledge, agreement, and dependence on Christ. Specifically, you have to know that victory is available, and we've just laid that groundwork, okay? That's what we've been doing since we started. There's victory available. He says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory. There is victory possible. You have to know that, that victory is possible. You have to agree that his victory is available to you. Make it personal. Just like we can't, we can't have collective salvation, we're not going to have collective victory either. Wouldn't it be great if just one of us could walk in victory and it rubbed off on everybody and, and we just all miraculously walk in victory? That'd be neat, <laughs> but it's not real, okay? More likely, one person walking in victory in the midst of a host of people not walking in victory is going to find that they struggle harder in the midst of that crowd, right? Just like you, you take one ripe apple and put it in a barrel of rotten apples, what's going to happen? 
But it's going to miraculously make all the rotten apples ripe, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's going to go the other way. And, and that's the way evil communication corrupts good manners, right? We read in Proverbs. You have to know that Jesus has already won victory. Victory is available. You have to, to agree that his victory is available to you. You can have victory. You say, you don't know my situation. Well, God does, and he says that you can have victory. Amen. And then you have to depend on what he's able to do in you. Place confidence and faith in these truths and then live accordingly. Live according to the truths that are laid out in Scripture. Now, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. And the reason I want you to turn there is because it's a, it's a lengthy portion of Scripture and uh, it would take a lot of slides for me to put it up on the screen for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians 2.20 and Romans chapter 6 are two of the powerhouse passages in Scripture as it relates to victory in Christ. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 <clears throat> says, Know ye not? That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, according to this passage... Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. We were baptized or placed into the death of Christ. Okay, this, this is not talking about water baptism here. Okay? If, you, if you put water into Romans 6, you find that you are by default talking about baptismal regeneration or salvation through works. Don't do it, okay? This is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are taken by the Holy Spirit and you are placed into Jesus Christ. You are baptized into his death. Okay? We, we saw water baptism last Sunday evening. It had no saving power whatsoever, but it is a picture of what takes place spiritually. This is not talking about water. When we trusted the Lord, we were baptized or placed into Christ. And so his death became our death. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Okay, How? How can I be crucified with Christ? He lived 2,000 years ago. I, they don't even know with exact precision which hill the cross was on outside of Jerusalem. So how can I be crucified with Christ? R Romans 6, I am crucified with Christ because I'm buried with him by baptism into his death. I'm placed into Christ. The moment that you trust Christ, you are placed into Christ. And so his death becomes your death. That's why, that's why it says here, if you look at verse 7, he that is dead... It's freed from sin. Our old man, in verse 6, is crucified with Christ. Now, on page 116, the old you is dead. You no longer need to be enslaved to sin. You've been freed from sin's dominion over your life. One thing about graveyards, they are notoriously low crime. Why? Don't have to worry about crime. Why? Because they're all dead, right? You, you, it's not something that they can do. You could, you could leave your wallet laying in on, on a tombstone of the most notorious robber on planet Earth and not have to worry about him taking it because why? Because he's dead and he doesn't do anything anymore. He that is dead is freed from sin. <laughs> dead people don't sin. 
I'm crucified with Christ. I've been buried with him by baptism into death. Another quote on page 116. Our old man refers to our unregenerate spirit. What our inner person was before we were saved. The body of sin points to the influence sin still has on our lives. Might be destroyed means rendered inoperative by removing its power to control. When you trust Christ, you're baptized or placed into Christ. What is his becomes yours. He died to sin. And sin doesn't, death doesn't have dominion on Christ, does it? No. And where am I? I'm in Christ. So sin doesn't have dominion over me either because I'm in Christ. Okay, Like, like with the basket, I stand, I stand in the basket. I say, I have victory over gravity. Right now, I have victory over gravity. And it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the basket. It has everything to do with the fact that I'm in the balloon. And as long as I stay in the balloon, all the benefits that, that accompany not being bound to earth by gravity are mine. I can, if, if they loose the ropes, I can rise because I'm in the basket. The death that Christ died, it says that in that he died, he died for all. There's new life in Christ. Another quote on page 116, he says, You were raised together with Christ and are now spiritually alive with him. Okay, right? Jesus died, and I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I died too. But Jesus didn't stay dead, did he? No, he rose from the dead on the third day, right? And gave, has, it, he proved his power over sin and death and hell, right? And because I'm in Christ, not only did I die with him, I also rose with him. According to Galatians 2.20, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You're raised together with Christ and now spiritually alive with him. His resurrection from the dead gave him permanent power over death. I close very quickly with this final illustration. We'll probably talk about it a little bit more next week because we're out of time. If you, How many of you would say that you've ever worked for some, you've had a boss that you would have considered to be uh, tyrannical, irrational, not a good boss? Anybody ever had? Okay, a few of you. Okay, some of you have it. That's great too. Okay, so you, you have this bad boss and he's, he's truly just a jerk. Okay, just to, to put it in, in scriptural terms. Okay, he's a jerk and, and you hate working for him. And then somebody comes along and they offer you another job. And you accept it. So you quit your old job. You quit your relationship with that boss. And you go to your new job. And you're working there. And things are going great. You've got a great... The, the, your new boss, he actually makes you part of the family. It's a family business. And he makes you part of the family. He adopts you into his family when you go to work for him. And you think, wow, this is something. And you're working for this, this new boss, and you get a call one morning from the old boss. And he says, you get into the shop and you be here by 6 tomorrow morning. What are you going to do? <laughs> what? It's easy when you put it in. Man, you, you probably, right now, you all have something you say, well, I'd say, and you, you lay into the guy. But, you know, you do have a choice. Could you show up the next morning? At six in the old shop? Sure. You could, but why? Why would you do that? And in the same way, I've got a new master. I've got a new family. I'm in Christ. And so when the old master calls and says, hey, you should do this, I say, you should get lost. I'm not with you anymore. I'm in Christ. I can have victory right now because I'm not bound to sin. I I die to sin, and I'm alive to Christ. And as long as I'm walking in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We'll pick up here next week with a little bit more. I, I hope it's starting to, to take shape, and, and maybe you say, you know, I know these truths. Well, I hope that it's making it more crystal clear and solidifying it in Scripture so that you can understand victory is possible. You don't have to sin. 
This afternoon, when you are tempted to sin, think of it as your old, tyrannical jerk of a boss calling up and saying, hey, get in the shop. You say, no, I don't work for you anymore. And I don't, I'm not, I don't have to sin because I've got a new master. He made me part of the family when, when, I, when I joined. I was adopted into Christ. There's victory available. Take a look at what we've gone over. Take a look at what we have ahead of us. We'll look at a little bit more next week. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for the victory that is ours because you loved us so much to send your son. To die on the cross in our place. And Lord, that we, when we trust him, Lord, that all of those benefits become ours. We have all that is in Christ. We thank you for that. I pray that you'd help us to live in light of these truths. I pray that we would understand that when sin comes knocking, Lord, that we don't have to answer. We don't have to live that life. That we can have true, lasting, habitual victory in our lives so long as we walk in the Spirit. Lord, I pray you'd be with us now. Prepare our hearts for the main service. I pray that your will would be done in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.